Thank you everyone for coming to the first of our Research Stars lecture for this year. We introduced these lectures last year so that you can get a taste of some of the research that's going on in the medical school. Because there is a tendency for us to get isolated within, in, within education. People are burrowing away doing such fantastic research. So the idea is to, about every six or eight weeks to have one of our stars come and talk to us about the research that they're doing. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Par no, I've got to say this right, Pariente, uh, who's actually been here for 17 years, and that just shows you how people are siloed in their different areas. We've never met before, before this evening. But I'm just delighted that he's come along to give the, the first of our 2013-2014 academic year research stars lecture. So thank you very much, Professor, for coming to talk to us this evening. There thank you. you. Thanks. <coughs> Okay, you can clap in the meantime. There was a joke. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I don't want to kind of uh, destroy the, the stereotype that you have about academics being narcissistic and self-centered, but how can I say no to an invitation that's called the star? I mean, so I will try to um, use the next 50, 45 minutes or so to talk about my research on the relationship between depression and inflammation, which is really a framework to think about the communication between the brain and the body and the physical health and the mental health and how really we are you know, a united body and it doesn't really matter which speciality of medicine you do, you're always talking about the same human being. Um, it's late in the day, so, and obviously uh, this lecture is called uh, The Star, so I thought I should give you one picture of my life as a rock star. So this is uh, my research group at the, next, at the last PAP meetings. <laughs> Sorry guys, what can I say? But if you do want to have some kind of rock star at, uh, you know, lifestyle, then do become academics. I mean, if the money is not as good, but you get to parties, you know, you go to lots of conferences, you do some work as well. Though. So, I hope I've uh, kind of activated your interest now, and this picture is a little bit more scientific, and it's talking about inflammation. So this generic mechanism by which the body responds to both external damage or internal damage, and which for many years has been considered almost like a unique immune system, somehow linked to just to, you know, cuts and wounds and things like this, or, you know, internal infections. And, pulmonitis and all these other things, but actually it's becoming more and more important in the pathogenesis of a variety of uh, physical and mental disorders. And you'll, you'll hear about inflammation in the context of coronary heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and more and more also in the context of mental health, and as I will discuss more today. So really this lecture is, as I said, about what happens in the brain and in the body of an individual where uh, it undergoes a period of severe stress and potential of depression. So when you know, an individual develops a state of continuous sadness, uh, clinically significant impairment in functioning, uh, often cries, uh, suicidal ideation, so a condition which most often is, is triggered or is associated with acute or chronic stress. And we know from research over the last you know, 40 or 50 years that the depression is not just a brain disorder. It's a body disorder. And there's a variety of biological systems that are abnormal. And here in this picture, those put the, the two that, are, that I'm more interested in in terms of research. And, and I'll show some data regarding these two systems. So here you can see uh, the inflammatory system. So in general, the immune cells and the, immune, the product of the immune cells that circulate in our blood, and I'll discuss how these are important components of a, of a behavioral response. And here you can see the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the main hormonal stress response system, which is also profoundly abnormal in major depression. And we'll go through some of this data in a second. And obviously here you see the brain because of the important communication of all these this, uh, systems together. Now, these slides, I mean, these are our data, but these slides could have been taken, could have been shown almost identically 40 years ago. These are the level of plasma cortisol measured at 9 in the morning in a group of severely depressed patients in a hospital. And as you see, can very simply see, 
Here you have uh, values of the press patient. They're much higher, they almost double the value of a group of mesh controls. The hyperactivity of, of the, uh, sorry, the hyperactivity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the subsequent hypercortisolemia is one of the most consistent findings in biological psychiatry. It's been shown over and over and over again in the press patient, especially in the most severe depressed patient. What is new, however, what has been perhaps one of the most recent developments in biological psychiatry is that parallel to this activation of the HP axis, there is also an activation of the immune system. So here you can see the plasma interleukin 6 levels in the same depressed patient. And as you can see, almost mirrors the cortisol, almost you know, higher, so higher, not double, but higher the levels of the healthy controls. And it's this coexistence between activation of the immune system and activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which we think is one of the key abnormality that underlies the pathogenesis of depression and potentially targets for treatment and intervention. Now, from a, from a strictly biological point of view, you can also see this as, as a model of looking at the interaction between the brain and the immune system, which is obviously bidirectional. So the brain, or if you like, the, 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 the behavior can regulate the function of the immune system. We know, for example, that stress increased cortisol levels. Uh, we know the stress increased catecholamines. And all of this has an effect on the immune function. But perhaps even more important is, the, is what you see here, which is the fact that the immune system can also affect the brain. So the cytokines and the product of the activation of the immune system have a profound effect on brain function, which again we'll discuss more in detail in the, in the next, uh, in the, in the next um, 20 or 30 minutes or so. And, and it's this, this effect and this communication that is really important in uh, in, in underlying the relationship between the mind and the body, uh, the brain and the, and the periphery. Now, as I said before, we can, when we talk about inflammation, that's the, that's the image that comes up in, your, in our mind. So, you know, this is a wound that cuts the skin, allows penetration of germs, virus, and bacteria, which then attract the local uh, activation of immune cells, monocytes, uh, which becomes macrophage once they get into the tissue, local production of inflammatory cytokines, which then work by containing the local damage. If the inflammation is relevant, if it's important, if it's diff diffuse or present in more than one site, you, you have a transmission of signal of inflammation across the body because obviously the cytokines released in C2 can also go into the circulation, will reach other immune station, spleen, lymph nodes, and will signal to this immune station that there is uh, enemy in the body, and then the system needs to get activated to, to protect the body. It's a very simple, very effective system. You can also have cells that are activated locally that then go into the circulation, transmit the immune signal in the other station. So when we talk about measuring biomarkers of inflammation in the context of biological psychiatry, there's a number of things that you can actually measure. So you can measure subpopulation of uh, immune cells from the blood, and there's been studies showing changes in the, the, the type of cells, of immune cells that circulate in the blood of the press patient. You can measure cytokines. you just show you some data on plasma interleukin-6, and I'll show you some more data on other cytokines. You can measure proteins that are released, uh, other proteins that are released in response to inflammation. And one of these is C-reactive protein, the CRP, as it's indicated in this picture. Now, I'm, I'm just spending one minute and one slide on CRP because it's a really important biomarker, both from a medical point of view and in the, in from a psychiatric point of view, because it is one of the most used biomarkers in psychiatric research in terms of understanding the role of the immune system. It has been chosen really because it has a profound medical relevance. So we know that high level of C-reactive protein predict further recurrence of stroke or coronary heart disease. So it has a medical, really medical prognostic importance. And that's why it's been chosen because it's so clinically relevant to, to use it as a marker of, of health, of physical health and immune activation also in psychiatric patients. 
the CRP is produced by the liver in response to uh, the activation of the immune system, the, largely in response to interleukin 6 activation. And as you can see, it has various, various functions, but one of them is that it coats bacteria or other external agents, favoring than the attack from immune cells and phagocytosis. It's probably also has a direct immunomodulating effect by accumulating in, in, the, in the tissue and facilitate inflammation. But the key thing is that you can measure it in the blood relatively easy, or laboratory can do it uh, consistently, reliably, and it gives you an indication of inflammation. And I'll show you some of our data that are directly using this biomarker. Now, what are the evidence that depression and inflammation are associated? Well, I'll show you our data. That's obviously not enough to convince you. So this is one of, of three meta-analyses now that have uh, compared all the studies measuring uh, cytokines or markers of inflammation in depressed patients versus control. This, as you can see, used the candidate, the most usual suspect candidate, CLP, which is just mentioned, IL-1 and IL-6, which are the two most important inflammatory cytokines. And without going into much details, the summary of the, the abstract here clearly show that each inflammatory marker is most positively associated with depression, so there is a, a link, an increase of each of these cytokines in patients with major depression. And interesting, we also found that it's not only in patients who are severely depressed in hospital samples, but also, in, as you can see here, in community-based samples. So patients that are in, in the community, and so they are within the moderate spectrum. So really a, a biologic abnormality across, if you like, the spectrum of disorders, or certainly across the clinical significant spectrum of depression. So first, if you like, evidence for, for link is that high level of inflammation is indeed present in depression. Now, how do we try to draw some conclusion about causation? I mean, obviously it's very difficult in, in, in research to draw a conclusion about causation, but temporal sequence is one of those um, evidence that supports causation. So is depression leading to inflammation or is inflammation leading to depression? And what most studies show now, and this is a one mechanism supporting this, it is actually inflammation that predicts and precedes the onset of depression. So it's something about the high level of inflammation that then predisposes the individual on the future development of depression. So the cross-sectional studies can show you this, but the longitudinal studies can show this, and this meta-analysis, which was recently published, show exactly this, that in all the study um, investigating, so all longitudinal studies that had investigated inflammation at time one and depression at time two, and they all found a clear association, a positive association, so that the press patient, so that high level of inflammation at the baseline predict the development of depression at a later stage. Later stage being months or years based on the different study. So there's not only a cross-section association, there's a longitudinal association with inflammation preceding and predicting depression. Okay? What other evidence can I give you to convince that this is not just some kind of exoteric say, story that a psychiatrist is coming to tell you at 5 o'clock in the evening? Well, randomized control trial, for those of you who are uh, fans of evidence-based medicine, this is perhaps one of the most influential trials published last year in the context, in fact this year, a few months ago, in the context of psychiatry. It's a clinical trial using infliximab, which is a TNF-alpha antagonist. Now TNF-alpha, many of you will know, it's uh, another pro-inflammatory cytokine, it's another of the really important pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's elevated in a lot of inflammation, inflammatory disorder, typically rheumatoid arthritis. And TNF-alpha antagonists have been shown to be effective drugs for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. So what this uh, study has done is, based on the evidence we are showing until now, and the concept that depression, so that inflammation is, is, uh, is a causally, causally linked to depression, has done a trial looking at whether using a potent anti-inflammatory, so TNF alpha antagonist, we, we can have an antidepressant effect selecting, in this case, a quite severe, severely depressed patient um, with, who had failed to respond to other antidepressants. Now, the results are really interesting because they are both negative and positive at the same time. So, if you just concentrate for a second on these slides here, on this part of the slide, you can see this is the change in the depression severity over time, so over the 12 weeks of treatment. 
Um, the HMD is the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, which is a typical scale that we use to measure longitudinally depressed symptoms. And if you look at the two lines, the black one being the black dot being the infliximab, map, so the TNF alpha antagonist, and the white one being placebo, you see there is not much difference. So this is a study that if you look at the whole population, it's considered a negative study. There's no effect. It does, there does not seem to be an effect of the anti-inflammatory on depressive symptoms. However, if you now look at this slide, part of the slide, here the authors have plotted the level of CRP expressed as logarithmic. So the higher the number, the higher is the CRP, so the higher is the inflammation. And the change in the Hamilton depression score. This part of this graph is patients who improve with treatment with infliximab, so patients that show an antidepressant effect. And as you can see, higher level of C-reactive protein here, higher level of C-reactive protein predict positive response on anti-inflammatory action, but a low, ne low level of CRP predict no antidepressant response, in fact, patients even getting worse. So what the study showed is indeed depression, inflammation is causally related to depression, and you can treat depression by treating inflammation, but only in subjects that do have increased inflammation, not in all depressed patients. Now, this is one clear example of what we now try to do across medicine, a personalized medicine approach. So you can imagine a future when a depressed patient comes into the clinic and I do the CRP levels, and based on the CRP level, I decided, okay, you can take fluoxetine, you can take Prozac, or no, I'm sorry, your CRP level are high, it might be better if you start straight on an anti-inflammatory. Okay? Personalized medicine, that's what we all want to do this, and it's coming in psychiatry too. So, there is definitely an active biological process for which this activation of the immune system exerts effect at the brain levels and induces the behavior that we call depressive symptoms, which can be targeted and produced by, and by targeting producing an improvement in the depressive symptom. But what are these mechanisms? Um, even those of you who are just at the beginning of the medical school will know, will have heard already the, the dogma that in the brain is an immune, immune uh, it's, it's immune protective. There is no relationship, there's no communication unless suddenly you got multiple sclerosis or you have meningitis. But actually, again, science has moved quite a lot forward from this dogmatic approach. We now know there's at least two pathways for which immune activation in the periphery can affect brain function. So first is through the vagus nerve that you can see on the top of the picture here. So the principle, as you know, is that the vagus nerve not only contains the efferent fibers regulating uh, parasympathetic activity, but also include afferent fibers that produce somatic, that, that uh, transmit somatic sensation, visceral sensation from the body. Now, the vagal nerve is sensitive to local inflammation. So the activation of the inflammatory system in the periphery directly stimulates the afferent fibers, which then brings a signal up to the vagal nerve into the brain, producing the activation of a number of brain areas uh, that here are indicated, and that are all, if you like, within the limbic system, so brain areas that are really relevant to emotional response. Um, here you can see, for example, the bed nucleus of the sphere terminalis, the paraventricular nucleus, which are really important for emotional response. So you now have a system for which peripheral inflammation can change the function of the brain by neuronal communication that does not require entry of cytokines into the brain. But you also have a second mechanism, which again is operating in condition of stress, which is the fact that obviously at the level of the choroid plexus, which is indicated in red across this picture of the brain, on the level of the choroid plexus where the cerebrospinal fluid is formed, the broadband barrier is quite little. In fact, it's not even the broadband barrier. It's the, you know, the barrier between the choroid plexus and the CSF is quite little. And there, around the area of the choroid plexus, you also have area in which the broadband barrier per se is little. So it allows the communication and the passage of cytokines signal 
between the blood and the brain. So there are studies showing that in this area of a more leaky broadband barrier, you have, which are indicated here, you have the possibility that the um, peripheral inflammation transmit the cytokine signal across the broadband barrier, either because cytokines go across the broadband barrier, or because the cytokines activate signal on the deuterial cells, which then transmit the signal on the other side of the, of the cells into the brain. Either way, there's clear evidence that you can have a diffuse activation of the immune system in the brain coming from the blood, in the area where the broadband barrier is leaking. So it's not true that the immune cells cannot communicate to the brain. They can, both indirectly to the vagal nerve and directly by allowing inflammation signal to go through a specific area of the, of the brain where the broadband barrier is leaking. OK. So if there is a relationship between the inflammation and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and they tend to be both of them activated and, and abnormal in both the press, in, in the same depressed patient. Is there a relationship between the two? And also, many of you may have thought, is that actually a counterintuitive finding? Because all of you know that group corticoid hormones, cortisol and its pharmacological um, equivalent, so dexamethasone or prednisone, are actually anti-inflammatory, have an anti-inflammatory action. So when we have a patient with a, you know, acute inflammatory status, we give them dexamethasone, we give them steroids, and cortisol is just the, the endogenous steroid. So how is it possible that in the same patient you have both increased activity of the HP axis, or increased cortisol level, and increased inflammation? So I'm going to go through, if you like, 40 years of research in biological psychiatry in one slide to try to put across what is the mechanism of the models that we are considering relevant for this at the moment. Now, this is what I've shown you already, the coexistence of high level of cortisol and high level of inflammation in the same depressed patient. So that's the question we're trying to address. So this is a cartoon showing the organization of the HP axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. As I said again, it's our main, main hormonal stress response system. Um, when you're in a forest and you control ion, you want your HP axis to get activated because the cortisol is going to give energy to your muscles, it will focus your cognitive function on the task ahead, and you know, it, it really help you either run away from the lion or kill the lion. Okay, so that's good. You, you really want this. And it works as all endocrine axis through a series of stational activation. So higher up, something is perceived as stressful that reduces activation of in, in, in uh, uh, subcortical structure, including the epithalamus. The epithalamus produces CRH, a corticotropin releasing hormone, which then stimulates the pituitary to produce a CTH. The CTH goes into the circulation, gets to our adrenal gland here on top of our kidney, and then the adrenal gland produces cortisol, which, as I said, is elevated in conditional acute stress, but equally elevated, chronically persistently elevated in patients with major depression. Now, in this figure, you can also see this other part, this arch that links cortisol back through the main station of the HP axis through a system that we call negative feedback. That's what the minus B means negative. So you want your stress response, your cortisol stress response, to be as quick as possible. So if you're in front of the lion, as I said, you have to run away from the lion, or you kill the lion. You can just kind of hang around for a couple of hours. So in half an hour, you're basically either winning or dead. So that's how long the stress response lasts. It lasts about half an hour, 40 minutes. That's how long is the peak and trough and peak of cortisol response is during normal stress reaction. And this is due to the fact that cortisol levels, by going up, also signal the higher level to the upper station of the HP axis and induce a negative feedback so that the upper level of the HP axis stops activating the production of cortisol and so there is a rapid return to normal. Now, the press patient have a malfunctioning negative signal in the HP axis. So this pathway here does not work. 
And that's why they have a persistently elevated level of cortisol. That's why they have persistently activated HP axis. And you can test this hypothesis using the dexamethasone suppression test. We may have, some of you may have heard because it's, it's been you know, used in research in biological psychiatry for many, many years. So if you can just summarize what I said until now, this negative in, in condition of stress or depression, you have um, an abnormality in the function of the receptor for cortisol that mediates this negative feedback. So the glucocortical receptor here that no longer function. These are the receptors that mediate the negative feedback. They no longer function. And this leads to what we call glucocortical resistance. So cortisol is not longer able to keep its own secretion under control. The HP axis activity goes up and cortisol level up persistently elevated. And you can test this with the dexamethasone suppression test, which is a test that uses the principle that if you stimulate the glucocortical receptor with dexamethasone, remember dexamethasone is just a pharmacological analog of cortisol, if you stimulate the glucocortical receptor with dexamethasone, you induce a powerful inhibitory signal in healthy individuals. But obviously, if you don't induce this negative uh, this signal in the first patient because the receptor does not work. Let me show you some slides. So here's the cortisol levels uh, over between 9 o'clock in the morning till 11 in the evening in healthy control. So if you focus first on the top line, the black line, this is our salivary cortisol. By the way, cortisol is really easy to measure in the saliva. You can measure it in the blood as well, but that is obviously invasive. And while in the saliva, it's really accurate, and you can look at it prospectively many times during the day on different days. If you measure cortisol during the day, you can see that it's much higher in the morning. So 9 o'clock is the peak. And there is actually an awakening response, because awakening is perceived as stressful by all of us. And then the cortisol level tends to go down during uh, the day. Here you can see the classic peak that you have around lunch in the middle of the day. And then continue to go down and down and down. Now, if this same healthy individual takes at 10 o'clock in the evening a small dose of dexamethasone, dexamethasone will stimulate the glucocorticoid receptor, induce the inhibitory signal, block the HP axis activity, and the next day the cortisol level will be completely shut down. You can see how there's virtually no production of cortisol at all the following day. And this is because of the effective ability of the inhibitory signal to keep cortisol under control. Now, what's happening in the first patient? OK, first of all, if you just concentrate again on the black line, these are the, just the value of cortisol throughout the day. First of all, please look at the number. I mean, here we're starting at 14 to 16. Here we're starting 8 to 9, so almost double, exactly the same frame of magnitude difference that I've shown you when you measure the plasma cortisol. So much higher level in depressed patient. And then, when the same depressed patient takes dexamethasone, as you can see, there's virtually no inhibition. Um, there's a little bit of less cortisol produced here and here. And certainly, you don't have this complete shutdown that you have in healthy control. The difference here is quite evident. Why? Well, because the glucocortical receptor in the brain that regulate this immune, sorry, that regulate this negative feedback is not working, and therefore when you give dexamethasone, there is no inhibition and the level of cortisol remains high. Now, this is quite a long story to go back to information. And at this point, I'm going to ask you to wait for one second because I need a sip of water. So, why have, uh, why have made this long, convoluted conversation about HP axis when we're really talking about inflammation? Well, obviously, I'm still trying to address the question of how can you have concomitant higher level of cortisol, which is supposed to be immunosuppressant, and a high level of inflammation? Well, what we now know is that in the cells of the immune system here, the, the same receptor for cortisol, so the receptor, of the glucocorticoid receptor, which mediates the inhibitory signal in the brain and does not work in the perspiration, also mediates the effect of cortisol on the immune cells and, guess what, does not work 
in the first patient. So the cells of the, the immune cells of the first patient are resistant to cortisol because the glucocorticoid receptor does not work. Exactly as the same receptor does not work in the brain, it also does not work in the periphery, in the immune cells. So you now have high level of cortisol, but in the presence of glucocortical resistance, you don't get the signal going through and the cells remain activated even if the cortisol level is high. Let's address the question, how can you have both concomitant HP axis activity, hyperactivity, and concomitant inflammation. Now, then the next question is, is this clinically relevant? Does that give us information that are important for our patient? The answer is yes. So I already showed you data from the clinical trial from another different, which I just want to clarify was not. I wish it was my study, but it wasn't my study. So I'll show you a clinical trial showing that high level of inflammation predicts response to anti-inflammatory drugs. But we have data showing basically the mirror image of that, which is that high level of inflammation predicts lack of response to standard antidepressants. Here we use a slightly different approach. We don't measure cytokines in the, in the serum or in the plasma, uh, but we measure the cytokines mRNA also produced in the blood, which you can do that by collecting blood in special tubes that stabilize mRNA from cells. And then you can do gene expression, either as a candidate genes, or you can do an affymetrics approach in which you compare thousands and thousands of mRNA. And we actually do both, although in this study I'm going to show you only the data from the, from the candidate genes. So we measure three cytokines into looking one, myth of macrophage inhibiting factor and TNF alpha. And we look at the level of inflammation before starting an antidepressant, and then we, co we correlate that with the, with the response to antidepressant treatment. This is now normal antidepressant, so Prozac or equivalent. And then we study where not Prozac were equivalent. And as you can see, higher level of inflammation measured by the, all the three cytokines, alpha, beta, myth, and TNF alpha, predicts lack of future response to antidepressants. It's higher in the non-responders, so those that do not improve with the standard antidepressant, have higher level of inflammation um, across these parameters. And this is actually really an important clinically and statistically meaningful finding. So if you look at the variance explained by the lab, by the um, level of the cytokines, how much can we predict of the treatment response to an antidepressant just using our cytokines level? You can see that by putting together the three cytokines here, we can explain almost half of the violence. So half of the amount of, of, you know, half of the amount of the response to an antidepressant can be predicted by showing whether the patient had high level of inflammation or not. In this case, the lack of response can be predicted by high level of inflammation. So by putting together the data from this um, study and the study and the clinical trial that I showed you before, you have this, as I said, this kind of true mirror picture that if you have high level of inflammation, you do not respond to standard antidepressant, but you may be better off with starting or receiving an anti-inflammatory drug, while if you have low level of inflammation, then you're responding more to standard antidepressants and you do not need an anti-inflammatory drug. These are both studies in this replication, so you know, please do not go out there tomorrow and start getting, you know, prescribing anti-inflammatory to your patient if you are a psychiatrist or, or taking anti-inflammatory if you are depressed, but definitely we are in the right direction for personalizing treatment in psychiatry. Now I'm aware of time, and there's one more piece of data that I want to show you before finishing, which is this one. So, why depressed patients have high level of inflammation? I mean, if we look at the biological mechanism, we discussed the fact that, you know, uh, okay, it's because the cells are not sensitive to cortisol, therefore they, they are activated, they're not kept under control by the, by the cortisol level, and that's fine, that's the biological mechanism. But why, you know, why is depression on this pathway 
leading to, sorry, why inflammation is on this pathway leading to depression. So one model that we have been describing for the last few years is the possibility that inflammation characterizes a group who are at risk of developing depression because of a trajectory of recurrent life stressors. So in other words, that first you have events in your life, and as I'll show you in a second, predominantly events in your childhood, so childhood trauma, repeat stressors in childhood, which are in itself a risk factor for depression. Then this leads to the inflammation, to the inflammatory responses, which then lead to depression. So the, the causal pathway really starts really very early. Now, it's not easy to test hypotheses like this because you need longitudinal cores. And I've been really lucky to be able to collaborate with uh, Asher and Kaspi and Kimi Moffitt that are at the Institute of Psychiatry and at Duke University, who are you know, uh, certainly some of the world's most famous social scientists. And they have uh, uh, coordinated a study in the Needham in New Zealand where they've been able to follow up the same birth cord since birth. Um, obviously, the study was started before they uh, came on board. And the uh, adult subjects are now in their 30s. And we did a very simple study. We looked at whether a history of childhood trauma was associated with inflammation in adulthood and how depression modified this interaction. And that's what we found. So, first of all, we look at history of maltreatment. So this is blood taken from adult individual, age 25, in which the history of childhood maltreatment has been ascertained prospectively. So has been ascertained around the time of childhood through interview and corroborating history at the time of the events, or, strat or shortly after. And then, and then we measure C-reactive protein, which, as I mentioned before, is really clinically relevant. And as you can see, an individual who has definite evidence of childhood treatment, treatment, you have high level of CRP compared to individuals with probable or no evidence of childhood treatment at all. So, information is not just a correlate of depression, it's a correlate of risk for depression, a risk which is conferred by a trajectory of a, li of a lifetime history of stress starting in childhood. The same findings are confirmed if you look at other biomarkers of inflammation. Here you can see fibrinogen, the white blood count, which you would imagine should be such a, you know, variable that changed so much our white blood count, but actually that's, there's a signal there and um, an inflammatory factor that puts together all these three variables. We then ask the next question, which how does in current, being depress current depression influence this relationship between maltreatment and inflammation? So here is now the findings. And again, if you just concentrate on the white column here, which is about the C-reactive <coughs> protein, which as I said is probably the most clinically relevant. The control group, are scaled down to zero. So this is different from control. So as you can see, patients that are currently depressed at the time which the blood is taken have higher level CRP. So that's confirmed the cross-sectional association between inflammation and being depressed. And these are adult in number. But then if you look at patients that are maltreated but they're not depressed, the level of CRP is actually higher. So a history of childhood maltreatment, even when the blood is taken, even if the when the blood is taken, the, perf the subject is perfectly healthy, a history of childhood maltreatment is enough to confer the state of inflammation. And in fact, as you can see here, if you if you have a history of maltreatment and you're currently depressed, there's not much more effect. So what perhaps we're measuring when we're measuring inflammation, we're measuring an intermediate phenotype. It's 
something which is on the path between a risk factor for depression, so childhood or treatment, and an outcome of psychopathology, which gives us, obviously, a biological framework, a biological pathway to try to understand what, for many of us, for many, many years, has just been some kind of psychological phenomenon. We always know, Freud said that, that a history of childhood maltreatment predisposed you to psychopathology in other people. We always knew that. But we always interpreted it as in a psychological construct, you know, in, in, in permanent abnormality in psychological functioning. But we now know that actually there are biological mechanisms underpinning this association, which are very important. And I want to conclude with this message. Two things I really want to, to kind of hope to have convinced you today. First of all, the psychiatry is not at all a soft science. Um, it's a relevant, very important branch of medicine because a third of all burden of disease is due to mental illness because it's very, very costly for the society and obviously it's a, it's a branch of medicine where you can help people. But more importantly, as an academic, psychiatry is a branch that has solid biological foundations that allows you to do the most sophisticated molecular research and really the interface with neuroscience. Yes, I am adv advertising for psychiatry. Any of you medical students wants to be a cardiologist or surgeon, shame on you. <laughs> and then I want to finish with the, again, just to, to, to reiterate this concept that for all psychological mechanisms, for all psychological phenomena and association between stress and psychopathology, there's always a biological mechanism and that inflammation may well be the mechanism of the future, the mechanism that will give us the next generation of drugs that help people and the next generation of biomarkers for personalizing medicine. Thank you very much.